We're ready to praise your name, God. Jesus, we're here for you. Let's sing all together. Are you ready? Check it out.
Oh, 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 oh,
Amen. When Jesus say yes, nobody can say. When Jesus say yes, nobody can say. I believe it. Do you believe it this morning? Do you believe it? place we can ever be in the house of our father in the house of the father there's a place for you and me and you know what he has his arms wide open just for you just for me this morning so I invite you to close your eyes not because we we're religious but because we want to just concentrate in his presence 
He has something beautiful in store for us this morning. And He wants to remind us that we belong to Him. We belong to you, Lord. I am who you say I am, Lord. Thank you for fixing your eyes on me. Thank you for fixing your eyes on us. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me.
a place for all of us in the house of the Lord. You are chosen and you are free in the name of Jesus. You are free in the name of Jesus. You are free in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Some people may not choose you, but God chose you. Hallelujah. Your mother may not say she wants you, but God wants you. Your friends say they don't want you, but God say he wants you. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Good morning, Life Point Church, and welcome. And no, I'm not the one that's uh, preaching today. Praise God, it's just the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Praise God, I just, I just love the Lord. He is awesome. He is marvelous. Woo, he is graceful, merciful, forgiving, all-powerful. Hallelujah. That's not for me. You better give it to God. You better give it to him louder. Hallelujah. Give it to him louder. Give it to him louder. Give it to him louder. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. He is worthy of all your praise. Woo. Good morning and welcome to Life Point Church. Welcome to our family online. You may be seated. And at this time, the youth that are from the 6th grade to the 12th grade, you may leave. Your class is about to start. The youth, 6th grade to the 12th grade, they were with us worshiping. And how awesome is that? Because the family together worshiping God. Because it's just not about the parents. It's also the kids. They're the next generation. And the devil can't have them in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I, I, okay, let me, let me contain myself. Praise God. Um, welcome, and if you are visiting us for the first time, welcome. I'm so happy that you're here to join us. Here we are a family, so some people may hug on you and, and love on you a little bit, and that's good. That's awesome, because we all need love. Amen? Amen. Love heals. Love transforms. For the love of God is, is compelling me right now just to run across this altar, but I can't. Amen? <laughs> My name is Virginia, and we like to connect with you, so we have these little connect cards um, and feel free after church at the entrance of the church we have these little bags that we would like to give you if you're visiting us for the first time praise God March 27 we will be having water baptism here at church the old is gone and dead and the new in Jesus Christ will, will be arise amen new creature in Christ are we and we have a sign-up sheet at the entrance and then on March 25th where my man at where my boys at my man Thank you, somebody. The first service, I barely got anything. I was like, whoop, whoop, where my men at? We're going to have a barbecue. Well, not we, y'all, because I'm not invited, you know. <laughs> I love some barbecue. Lord knows I do. Yep, thank you. Barbecue is awesome. Y'all going to have a barbecue, and we're going to be standing strong in the Lord. Amen? Uh, standing strong in the Lord, barbecue for all men, ages 13 and up. Praise God. And let's give a round of applause for Pastor Robbie. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Virginia. How's everybody doing today? Smile. And let me see it. I'm, I'm glad you're here today. Listen, let me just say this. This is compelled day at our church. Maybe... You were invited by someone today, or maybe we met you in the community yesterday. My name's Pastor Rob Morrow. My wife, Sydney's right over there, and we just want to welcome you to Life Point Church. Uh, we, we love our community, and we are honored that you're here with us today. However you got here, it doesn't matter, but we're honored to have you. And we're just believing that you have an encounter with a true living God today in this place. So welcome. Uh, ushers, if you would, come forward. Uh, we'll take up our tithes and offerings this morning. Did you enjoy the worship today? It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. I thank you for every person that came into this building today. God, we have guests, we have visitors, we have family, we have friends. And we just say thank you for, for bringing them here today, God. And Lord, we know that today is a special day that people are going to encounter you. God, people that have been bound to something will be set free. People that have been hurt in their life will be healed today. And we say thank you. And Lord, I pray over this offering, this time of giving, that you would bless this offering, that the tithe would come to you. 
and we honor you with it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. God bless you as you give today. us yesterday for the compelled day. Uh, thank you. Those of you, listen, it'll come again next month. You'll hear more about it because we, we had a lot of fun. Listen, we just went in the community yesterday and we just told people we loved them. We, really, we said thank you for doing what you do. I, I stopped the postman in his little truck and said, hey, he's like, what do you want, man? I was like, just want to say thank you for bringing the mail. You know, just being friendly. We had such a blast yesterday. I'm looking so forward to the future of what, what we're going to do through this church and, and reaching our community. So uh, be listening up for that. But today is a special day. Uh, we have our family member, Johnny Jernigan, all the way from Mobile, Alabama, to bring the good news. And, and listen, it started in the first service. And I'll just tell you, it was just, it was just an opportunity uh, when Johnny talks about the things that are going on in the world, how crazy this world is right now. Like the gas station's even crazy now, right? Everything is crazy, and, and it's just the sign. If you know the Bible, even if you don't know the Bible, it is the sign that the end is coming. Jesus Christ is coming back. And the Bible is very clear about that and how we have to make that decision for Him. So it was really fun in the first service. and. I know it's going to happen again in this service and in our Spanish service today. But again, we welcome you. Thank you for being with us. And I want to give Johnny plenty of time. So give the best life point welcome again. Well, I forgot. Some, some of us were here. Who was here Friday night? Okay, so you heard Johnny Friday night. He's better on Sunday than he is on Friday. So I'm really excited. I love you, buddy. Love you, man. <laughs> Amen, amen. Come on, can we all stand together, please? I know we just let you sit down. Can we give Jesus the greatest shout of praise we can? Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. We bless you, Lord. We exalt you. Remain standing, please. Everybody smile big. Let me see all your teeth. Make this faith declaration. I wish you could have seen that little blonde-headed girl back in the back. That was great. That was great. Everybody smile big. Let me see all your teeth. Everybody say it out loud. Say, I believe. That God wants me to win. Come on, say it again. I believe that God wants me to win. Now, how many know if you tell a lie long enough, you'll believe it? And how many know if you tell the truth long enough, you'll believe it? And I hope you believe this today with all of our heart. God truly wants you to win in every area of your life. I heard one man say many years ago, he said, Jesus is not coming back for a bunch of losers. Come on. He's coming back for a victorious church, a triumphant church. And he wants you to win in your health. He wants you to win in your finances. He wants you to win in your family. And he wants you to win in your faith. And so truly, I hope you believe that. God is for you. We sang about it again. He's not against you. He is for you. And if you believe that, say, I believe. It is always an honor to be here. I love Pastor Rob and Pastor Sidney. And uh, I love this church. Uh, last time I was here, you voted me in as your staff evangelist. So just in case you need to do it again, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposing it carries. All right. So see, nobody voted against it. If you're a guest today, we welcome you and we bless you in the name of the Lord. My name is Johnny Jernigan. I'm from Alabama. Everybody say Alabama. Alabama. So I don't know everybody here. So in the count of three, everybody tell me your name as loud as you can. Here we go. One, two, three. All right, now I know everybody. All right. I'm about to read something to you from God's Word. 
And when we make a statement like that, that's a profound statement. That we don't believe this is just some book. We really believe these are the words of God. And what I'm about to read to you is a parable about what maybe things would look like at the end of time. As we stand here today, Pastor referred to it a moment ago, we hear all the political pressure around the world. Uh, Pilots can't even get to their flights now and take off because there's not enough workers. People can't find workers for their jobs. Gas prices are astronomical. The war that's happening in Ukraine, it feels like the whole world is on fire. Jesus said when you see these things happen, do not be alarmed. Don't be afraid. He said these things would happen. And he said it would happen right before the return of Christ. And people have been telling me for years, I've heard about the coming of Jesus. They've been saying that for 2,000 years. Look at me. Time with God is very different than time with us. The Bible says a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. So really it's only been three days since Jesus was here. I want you to understand that. So he said, when you see these things happening, don't be alarmed, but look up, because where does your help come from? My help comes from the Lord. So I want to read this to you, and I need you to prepare your heart in these next few minutes. And so I need you to just pray with me for two things. First of all, I want us to pray for God's anointing. Everyone say God's anointing. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's not amazing music like these guys and girls and that that really pregnant woman. Uh, it It is not preaching. It is the anointing that breaks the yoke. So here's the rules this morning. If I say something that sounds good, you help me preach. You say amen. Hallelujah. That was good. If I say something you don't like, you say, amen, hallelujah, that was good. So you helped me this morning. Second thing I want us to pray for is an open heart. Everybody say an open heart. Boy, if you'll open your heart in these next few minutes, the eternal God of the universe wants to speak to you. That's why we're so honored that you are here with us. Would you lay your hand on your heart with me? Everybody bow your heads. Would you pray with me? Those watching online, would you join us? Father, in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, we stop and we look to you and we acknowledge you as our King, our Lord, our Savior, and our Messiah. And you said if we lift you up, you would draw all men to you. So through these songs and through this preaching, we ask, oh God, that you would touch every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, that when we leave in just a little while, we'll leave touched by heaven and the glory of our God, and we will know a little bit more of maybe what you were trying to say to us about the end of time and what it would look like. So speak to us now. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you want to say to our heart today. And we're careful to give you the praise and the glory for you, and you alone, King Jesus, are worthy to receive praise. And we give it to you now in Jesus' name. Can we give our God a shout of praise one more time? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Before you're seated, uh, would you look at somebody next to you right in the eyes and say, man, you look good today. Would you tell them that? Just like that. (laughs) I know some of you looked at those men and you had to tell a lie. All right, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. (laughs) Would you open your Bibles with me if you have them to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 14 and beginning in verse 15. Luke chapter 14 and beginning in verse 15. We'll look at God's Word there together in just a moment. I want you to know that as we said those things a moment ago, that it feels like there's, the world is on fire and there's pressure everywhere. And many, many people feel like they're in trouble. It's kind of like this little boy years ago, he was at home And uh, this woman called his house. He picked up the telephone and he was whispering and he said, hello. She said, hello, my name is Susan Smith. I work for Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. Is there someone in your house I can speak to right now? Little boy came back on the phone whispering and he said, yes. She said, who's in the house with you right now I can speak to? Little boy came back on the phone whispering and he said, my mother. She said, well, that's fine. Can I please speak to your mother? Little boy came back on the phone whispering and he said, she's busy. She said, well, that's fine. She said, is there anybody else in the house with you right now? Little boy came back on the phone whispering, and he said, yes. She said, well, who else is in the house with you right now? Little boy came back on the phone whispering and said, my father. She said, that's fine. Can I please speak to your father? Little boy came back on the phone whispering, and he said, he's busy. Well, she was a little confused. She said, well, is anybody else in the house with you right now? Little boy came back on the phone whispering, and he said, yes. 
She said, well, who else is in the house with you right now? The little boy came back on the phone whispering, and he said, a policeman. She said, a policeman? Can a police speak to the policeman? The little boy came back on the phone whispering, and he said, he's busy. Now she's terrified. She said, what are your mom and dad and this policeman so busy doing? The little boy came back on the phone whispering, and he said, they're busy looking for me. Bye. And he hung up the phone. Now, how many of you know if his mom or dad or the policeman find him, they're going to beat the tar out of that little boy? Come on. That little boy's in trouble, and he doesn't know it. As we look at what's happening around the world right now, so many people are in trouble and they don't even know it. That this thing is winding down. We're coming to the end of time that Jesus said that he would once and finally come and receive mankind into himself. And we would stand at the judgment seat of Christ that all of our works would be laid at the feet of God and the fire of God would consume them and there would be gold and silver and precious stone or there would be wood, hay, and straw. Anybody ever heard that before? We're coming to that day that 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, told us about that day. And in this parable, a parable is a story that Jesus was a master storyteller. And he was trying to tell a story of maybe what it would look like at the end of time and these things that we see going on around us right now. And I want to read this to you out of the book of Luke chapter 14 and beginning in verse 15. It's on the screen. Would you read along with me? The scripture says this. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man or the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. Everyone say excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. No explanation needed. Verse 21, then the servant came back to his and reported this to his master. And then the owner of the house became angry and he ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. So their servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. I want you to read verse 23 very quickly with me. Everyone read it out loud with me. Come on. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I want you to know that there was something in this parable that was really on the mind of Jesus when this was written. When this, if it's in red letters in the Bible, who do we believe said this? We don't believe these are the words of just a man. We don't believe these are the words of a translator. We really believe these are the words of Jesus. And we believe when Jesus uttered this and he said this to them in painting a picture of what this end time banquet could look like, when he says this, there was one thing that was really close on his mind. He wanted his house full. He wanted everyone to have a chance to come and feast at the banquet of the Lord. And that everything is now ready, I have paid the price, and now everyone can come and feast at the table of God. No matter what mistakes you've made, many things you've done wrong, many things have gone bad in your life, you have an invitation to come and feast at the table of the Lord. Can you imagine anything greater in all of your life? Can you imagine if the Queen of England called you today and said, Kate and William, Harry and Meghan would like to meet with you in Buckingham Palace? We're sending you round-trip first-class tickets to come to Buckingham Palace for three days, all expense paid. You and whoever you want to bring, come and feast with us at the table in Buckingham Palace. If Queen, Queen Elizabeth and Harry and Meghan and William and Kate said, come and feast with them, how many believe you'd find a way to get there? Come on, somebody. You didn't raise your hand. Don't you lie to me. How many of you think you could find a way to get there? Come on, hold your hand up. What I want you to know is Jesus was giving an invitation far bigger than the Queen of England, far bigger than any man-made leader. He was saying, I am giving an invitation now for everyone who is dead to come to life, everyone who is broken to be put back together, everyone who is lost to find their way, and they can feast at the table of the Lord Everything is all ready. But the Bible says that all alike began to make excuses. Everyone say excuses. The title of my message today is No More Excuses. 
Can you say that with me? No more excuses. Can you say it really loud? No more excuses. How many of you have ever given someone an excuse before and you knew you were giving them an excuse? Would you hold your hand up? Some of you are still lying. All right, you know you did. How many of you have ever had somebody give you an excuse before and you knew they were giving you an excuse? What I'm about to tell you is a true story. Uh, This happened to me when I was a sophomore in high school and uh, we were getting ready for our big homecoming football game. And how many know that homecoming football game is the big game of the year where the girls were those big, big, huge flowers and the guys get all dressed up and, and they want that special date. And there was a young lady in my school She was in the ninth grade. I was in the 10th grade. And I wanted to escort her for our homecoming football game. She was so beautiful that when she she would walk by, my heart felt like it was beating out of my chest. I wanted her attention so bad. And she was so beautiful, it just hurt to look at her because she was just so beautiful. And so I wanted to escort her for this homecoming football game. So I started hanging around her. I carried her books to class for her. I sat with her in the cafeteria. I wrote her letters. I called her on the phone. I even sent her flowers. And finally the big day came when Lynn looked at me and she said, Johnny, would you please escort me across the field for our homecoming football game? And I said, yes, I'd love to. Because it was the first chance I'd ever had to wear my brand new three-piece blue corduroy suit. It was the original bell bottoms. Anybody remember those? All right. Took five minutes for the back to catch up with the front, you know, with every step that you took. And so I had my big bell bottoms. She had her big flower. And we went to our stadium there in Mobile, Alabama. And there were about 10,000 people in the stands that night because these were the two largest high schools in our city. And they, at halftime, they called the homecoming court to walk across the field. And her name started with a B, Bethay. But it's almost like they said my name louder than anybody else's that night. I'll never forget it. It was almost like they said, Lynn Bethay, escorted by Johnny Jernigan in his three-piece blue corduroy suit. So I start escorting her across the field. And after the game, we went to our gymnasium for our homecoming dance. It was amazing. My arms were around her. Her arms were around me. And we were swaying to the music. Can everybody sway with me a little bit? Come on. We were just swaying to the music, and everything was wonderful. And then she whispered in my ear, and she said, Johnny, I have to tell you something. And I thought she was going to tell me something really sweet. And I said, well, what is it, Lynn? She said, well, I have to tell you that. Well, I have to tell you that I can't go out with you anymore. I said, what do you mean, woman? You can't go out with me anymore. You got on your big flower. I got on my brand new suit. What are you talking about? She said, well, the reason I can't go out with you anymore is because... Well, the reason is because I'm dying. I said, what? She said, yes, i got this thing growing on my brain. The doctors have only given me three months to live. I can't go out with you anymore. I can't talk to you anymore. Mascara started running down her face. She runs to the end of the gymnasium with all of her friends. And I'm in a dead panic because you don't normally hear somebody's dying while you're dancing with them. So I chase her to the end of the gymnasium. I said, Liam, what are you talking about? She said, no, they've only given me three months to live. There's things growing on my brain. I can't go out with it anymore. I can't talk to you anymore. For the next three months, I wrote her letters. She didn't answer any of my letters. For the next three months, I called her on the phone. She didn't answer any of my phone calls. For the next three months, I went by her house, and she didn't come to the door one time. And after six months, I noticed Lynn was still looking very, very healthy. Then I found out she was building a heavy-duty industrial strength relationship with one of the star football players on our football team. She dumped me with the excuse she was dying. Ladies, that's just a little bit drastic, all right? All she had to do was say, eat dirt and die, all right? I would have left her alone. But no, the heifer told me she was dying. Now I'm going to tell you. And you got to know in Alabama, heifer is a term of endearment, all right? That's the worst excuse I've ever heard in my life. And this happened 38 years ago. And I still see her in Mobile sometimes. And I ask her, I say, hey, Lynn, how do you feel today? And she says, shut up. And i got to be honest, I'm really glad I never married her. (laughs) She's ugly as a mud fence, I'm going to tell the truth. It's the truth. The years have not been kind. Now, that is a true story 
that happened to me while I was in high school. That's the worst excuse I've ever heard in my life. In this parable, in the story, Jesus says that there will be a great banquet. And how many of you know, if God says it's a great banquet, it's going to be a great banquet. And, and, and I, I don't know about you, but I have a vivid imagination. I'm sure there's 45-pound butterball turkeys and corn on the cob and black-eyed peas and fried okra and cranberry sauce, but you don't have to eat that. Pecan pie, apple pie, Coke and bread and tea. And, and, and Jesus said, go and tell them everyone can come and feast with the king. So the servant goes to the first person according to the parable and says, come and eat. The banquet is ready. And the first person said, well, I, I'd like to come, but I just bought a field and I got to go and see it. Please excuse me. I'm not going to be able to make it. Now, how many of you would buy a piece of property you've never seen before? Don't raise your hand if you would. <laughs> Sister Jamaica, that is a bad answer. That is serious Dane Bramage, serious Dane Bramage, and not a quality choice of a piece of property. So the servant goes to the second person and says, come on, 45-pound butterball turkeys, corn on the cob, black-eyed peas, fried okra, cranberry sauce, but you don't have to eat that, pecan pie, apple pie, Coke, Coke and bread and tea, all it's already come and feast. And the second person said, well, I'd like to come, but I just bought five cows, and I'm not going to be able to make it. i got to go check them out. Please excuse me. I can't make it there. Now, how many of you would buy a car? Don't raise your hand. How many of you would buy a car that you've never driven before? Don't raise your hand if you would. That is serious. She's raising her hand again. Stand up. Stand up. Just stand up. Stretch your hands toward her. Lord, deliver Sister Jamaica from bad choices. Everybody say amen. Don't raise your hand again. All right. So the second person is much more interested at staying home with their cattle than they are at feasting at the table of the Lord. So the servant goes to the third person of the Bible, tells us in the story I just read to you. He goes to the third person, and he says, come on, 45-pound butterball turkeys, corn on the cob, black-eyed peas, fried okra. Cran Does anybody like cranberry sauce? You don't have to eat that. Pecan pie, apple pie, Coke, and bread, and tea. And the third person said, I just got married, and my wife's making me clean the house, build a new addition to the house, and she's got me right there doing all the things a married man has to do. And all the married men say, Amen. there's a few brave ones, a few brave ones. I want you to understand that the Bible says that they were much more interested at in staying home with their cattle, staying home with their, their new property, or staying home with their new spouse than they were at feasting at the table of the Lord. And I can tell you this. Listen to me. All over America, that sounds just like the culture that we're living in right now, that people are more preoccupied and distracted by their wealth, by their possessions, by their relationships, or what they own than feasting at the table of the Lord. And I want you to know that God is saying everyone is invited. No matter how rich they are, no matter how poor they are, no matter how many mistakes they've made or how broken they are, you are welcome. You can come, whosoever will, and feast at the table of the Lord. But they made three mistakes in this parable that we're continuing to make today as a culture. And I want to give these to you. The first mistake that they made in this parable was the Bible says they all had excuses. Everyone say excuses. The second mistake they made in this parable was they obviously had empty expectations. Empty expectations. Can you say that with me? Empty expectations. The third mistake they made in this parable was they became the wrong example. Everyone say the wrong example. The first mistake that they made was they had excuses. Can I tell you this? That the enemy, the Bible says about Satan that he is the father of lies. In other words, he cannot tell the truth. He is incapable of telling the truth. And the enemy is very good at whispering to every one of us sitting in this room, especially late at night when it gets dark and it gets quiet, to tell us you've made too many mistakes. God can never use you. You'll never be good enough. You'll never have enough. You'll never be TikTok famous. You'll never be Insta famous. You'll never have what Hollywood has. I mean, Hollywood, you'll never have what they have, and you'll never be good enough to measure up for God to use you. And many of us sitting in this room have heard those lies. You're not smart enough. You don't know enough. You'll never have enough. You've made too many mistakes. God can never use you. I'm going to tell you, that's not what God says about you. 
As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us, they sang about it just a moment ago, that God says, I made you beautiful. God says, I have a plan for you, and those plans are to bless you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So I want you to know that I have learned in my life to believe just the exact opposite of what the devil tells me. So when the devil tells me I'm not going to get healed, guess what that means? I'm about to walk in divine health. When the devil tells me I'm not going to have enough, guess what that means? I'm going to have more than enough. When the devil tells me my family is not going to get saved, guess what that means? I might as well buy a Bible and have their name printed on it because they're about to get saved. When the devil tells me we're not going to have revival, guess what that means? We're about to see a move of God sweep across our culture, and God is about to do something marvelous. I have learned to believe if it's the opposite of what God says about me, I believe just the opposite of what the devil tells me because I can tell you when does most sin take place during the day or during the night come on let me hear you real loud during the night because we gravitate to the darkness and the enemy the only thing he can do is tell you you're not smart enough you're not pretty enough you're not handsome enough you'll never have enough you'll never be enough God cannot use you I'm just telling you that is a lie And the enemy loves to use our past to stop us from embracing our future. Because there's not one of us in this room right now or watching online that we wish we couldn't go back and change decisions we made in the past. Every one of us in this room, I've made so many horrible mistakes in my past that I wish I could go back and change. Look at me. None of us can go back and change yesterday. The only thing we can do is start right now and begin to build our future with God and say, God, I don't want to miss the banquet. I want to feast at the table with my God. I don't want to miss it. I don't want excuses. And here's what I hear all across America, and I hear this a lot. Well, God will forgive me because he's a forgiving God. I'll just do that every once in a while. There's nothing wrong with doing something every once in a while because God will forgive me. Look at me, and I want you to hear this very clearly. Hell will be filled with people who did something every once in a while. Everybody say, I still love the little preacher. Come on, say it. I love the little preacher. I think he's a sweet little man. Listen to me. I want you to hear this very, very clearly. Be very, very careful to say that God will forgive me, and I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. That is a very sloppy approach to the grace of God. And you need to be very, very careful. He is a forgiving God. But the Bible tells us, he who knows to do right and does it not, to him it is sin. And I want you to know, be careful to say, I can just do that every once in a while. And the enemy is very, very good at saying, oh, it's okay. God will forgive you. Just keep it under control. Don't let it get out of whack. Keep it under, just do it every once in a while. Listen, my God, the night that I got saved, on July 22nd, 1979, I was a borderline alcoholic. I was in and out of trouble with the law. My life was a mess. But when I went to an altar and I said, Jesus, move in my heart, I want you to know I haven't had a drink of alcohol in my mouth since that night. God changed everything. I led my dad to Christ. I led my mother to Christ. I led my brother to Christ. He's a Baptist preacher. Y'all pray for him. Then I led two of my sisters to Christ. And God changed my whole future because I stopped making excuses for what I used to do. And I want you to know, you, when you, people say this all the time. Well, the reason I'm the way I am is because of what my daddy did to me. The reason I'm the way I am is what my, my mama did to me. The reason I am the way I am is what a, poli- a policeman did to me. The reason I am the way I am is what, what, what a teacher did to me. Re- I do what I do because a pastor did something to me. Can I tell you that when we all stand before the eternal God, you're not going to be able to blame your mama or your daddy or your parents or your pastors or anybody else. It's going to be me and my relationship with God, or am I just going to make excuses? Well, I do that because that's just who I am. Let me tell you this. God loves you so much. Just like he loved me so much, he took alcohol out of my hands and showed me there is no high like the most high. Come on. There is no pill. Listen, there is no pill like the gospel. Hallelujah. 
I, I know that's stupid. All right, okay. So I want you to know the enemy is very, very good at screaming in our ear. Uh, you, it's okay to do that every once in a while because God will forgive you. Be very careful with that because there is no guarantee that he that knows to do right and does it not to him, it is sin. Stop blaming people around you and say, God, I want to kneel before you and I want to feast at that table. The second mistake they made in this parable was not only did they have excuses, the Bible says they had empty expectations. They obviously just didn't expect very much from this banquet. It's the same way in churches all across America. See, I'm in a different city every week. And, and, and I go to different churches all the time. And, and we think we got this whole church thing figured out. Can y'all scoot over right there a little bit? And see, we think we got this whole church thing figured out. That we know what we're going to do when we come to church. We know we're going to sing some songs because wasn't that good a while ago? And we know that we're going to hear announcements from Sister Announcements Woman. Where did she go? There she is. Hallelujah. And then we know we're going to take the offering because there's three things you can count on in life. That's life and death, and the offering will be taken in church. Come on, somebody. And then we know somebody's going to get a microphone like I've got right now, and they're going to scream at us for a little while. And we know before we leave, we got this whole thing figured out. We know before we leave, they're going to ask us to come to the front. We know they're going to ask us to come pray. And I watch people all over America, they just start dragging to the front. My God. It's 11.45 and I'm starving to death, God. How long will that preacher preach, God? Make that little fat man shut up, God. How long do we have to stay here? And then you know what we do? When we dismiss, everybody jumps up and skips out and goes outside and stands in the foyer for another hour. And I want you to know this. Listen to me. We watch movies for hours. I want you to know we watch sporting events for hours. This generation binge watches Netflix for 30 hours at a time. What's wrong with staying in the house of God for a long period of time? Because some of you got that same look on your face like, oh, God, oh, God, how long is this going to last, God? How long quick can we leave? And I want you to know this. If you expect nothing, you'll get it every time. Nothing. Or you can expect that the eternal God of the universe who loves you and knows you by name, that he said, before I created you with my heart, and with my hand, I created you with my heart. That I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. That no matter where you've been or what's going on in your life, that God says, come to me and feast at the table of the Lord. The problem is, so many people expect so little when they come to the house of God, very little happens. Because we think it's the man of God or the woman of God that's got to do that. And I want you to know, I travel every week all over this country, and there are very few pastors in America who have more vision and more dream for a group of people than your pastors. Do you love them? Do you love them? And I can tell you this, they love you. And I want you to know, if you expect very little, you're always going to get very little. But he says, ask and it will be, seek and you will, knock and the door will be, not maybe not possibly, it will, for whosoever will, and if you'll just ask. If you'll just seek, if you'll just knock. I was in a Benny Hinn crusade many, many years ago. Anybody here know Benny Hinn? Uh, he was in Orlando for years and lives in Dallas, Texas now. He doesn't do crusades anymore, and if you'd like to know why, I'll explain that to you after the service, um, and it's a very good reason. I was in his crusade in Mobile, Alabama many, many years ago, and my wife and I were sitting in the minister's section. There were 10,000 people that had gathered in the arena there in Mobile, Alabama, and we had come because Benny Hinn has a, a very powerful gift that the Lord has used him to heal the sick. And so we went to the crusade, and there was a 400-voice choir up on the platform, and it was beautiful. And Benny Hinn was not even on the platform. And regardless of what you think of Benny Hinn, let me just tell you my story. We were sitting in the minister's section, and there was a, a woman in front of us with her son who was about 12, 13 years old maybe, and he had a breathing mask on and an oxygen tank right next to him. And you could hear every breath this child took just. <laughs> and I will never forget the mother put her arm around her little boy. And she, she made this statement. She said, son, 
they had driven from Baton Rouge, Louisiana to Mobile, Alabama. That's a three and a half hour drive. And she said this. She said, if nobody else gets a miracle today, we've come for a miracle. Benny Hinn was not even on the platform, but they were singing those, those songs, and it was so powerful. And you can sing it with me. Come on. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Come on, real loud. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Benny Hinn was not on the platform, but the next voice you heard was Benny Hinn's. And he stepped out on the platform in front of 10,000 people. And he said, the Lord is present to heal. And he began to call out diseases, different things that God was healing in that room. And he called out cystic fibrosis. And the little boy ripped off his mask in front of his mama, in front of us, there in the minister's section. He said, Mama, I think it's me. I think it's me. I can breathe. I can breathe. And Benny Hinn said, if God is touching you, run up on the platform and tell us what God is doing. So the boy took off running in front of 10,000 people. His mama took off running right behind him. And I took off running right behind her. I wanted to see what God was doing. So Benny Hinn called this boy up on the platform, and he said, what is God doing for you? He said, I can breathe, Pastor Benny. For the first time in my life, I can breathe. And Benny Hinn laid his hand on this boy, and the boy fell on the platform. Not yet, musicians. Not yet. Not yet, musicians. Uh, I want you to understand, this little boy fell on the platform, and, and I said, God, are you really healing this boy or is this just some Pentecostal thing we do to get people excited? So you know what I did? I followed that boy the rest of that night. I didn't leave his side. He never left my sight. And can I tell you this? That boy did exactly what the Bible says every time Jesus touched somebody. He went off dancing and leaping for joy. And he left his oxygen tank and his breathing mask in the front section of the minister section. And he left that place totally healed by God. Somebody say amen. amen. Now look at me. I believe it had very little, if nothing, to do with Benny Hinn. I believe it had everything to do with a mama's expectation. They said, God, if nobody else gets a miracle, if nobody else gets a touch from heaven, if nobody else touches God, I believe you can do this for me. Hallelujah. Whatever you're going through, it's not too big for God. No matter what's happened in your past, it's not too big for God. No matter what the enemy is doing to you, and you may feel so alone, even in a room this big, I want you to know that God is for you. Well, they just didn't expect very much. They wanted to stay home with their spouse. They wanted to stay home with their property. They wanted to stay home with their cattle. And they missed feasting at the table of the Lord. They had excuses. They had empty expectations. The third mistake they made in this parable was they became the wrong example. The wrong example. Will you say that with me? The wrong example. The Bible uses this little throwaway phrase. It says they lost their place at the banquet. Think about that with me for just a moment. Does that mean they lost it for a, a, an hour? Does that mean they lost it for a day? Did they lose it for a week? Did they lose it for a year? The inference is they lost it forever. Look at me. I want to try to paint a picture for you what forever is. Because we as Americans are very, very time conscious. It is 1151 right now. We'll be leaving here in just a few minutes. We're very, very time conscious as Americans. But I want you to know time is very, very different with God than it is with us. Let me, let me show you a picture of forever. Forever is like a bird that flies out here to the beach in Fort Lauderdale, Florida and grabs one grain of sand in his beak and he turns and flies all the way to Long Beach, California. Would everybody fly with me? Come on. And, and he drops that grain of sand onto the beach of Long Beach, California. Then he turns and flies back to Long, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Would everybody fly back with me? Come on. That's a wounded bird right there, bro. <laughs> you only got one wing going there, all right? 
and he grabs one more grain of sand in his beak. And he turns and flies back to California. Would you just, one more time, can everybody fly with me? Come on. Now look at me. By the time that bird has removed every grain of sand from the beaches of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, onto the beaches of California, flying back and forth one grain of sand at a time. By the time he removes every grain of sand from the beaches of, of Fort Lauderdale to Long Beach, California, that is the beginning of eternity. Eternity is a long time. Eternity in hell will be longer. So what happened back at the banquet? The Bible says the master became angry. Everybody say angry. He got angry because he said, I've invited them, but they want to stay home with their spouse. They want, to stay, they want to keep their relationship. They want their property. They want their cattle more than they want to feast at my table. They've lost their place at the banquet. Then he said, here's what I want you to do. Go get the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame and bring them in. And they brought them in on crutches. Their hair was bad. Their breath was bad. They probably had flies flying all around them because they've been homeless for so long. But they sat down and there was still room. Like we have some empty chairs here today. And, and they said, what do you want us to do? And then the master said, I want you to go to the highways and edges and I want you to compel them. Everybody say compel. Real loud, compel. The word compel is a very, very strong word in this passage. And here's what the word compel means. You can look it up later. It means do whatever is necessary to persuade. Do whatever is necessary to influence. Do whatever is necessary to get them to follow you to what you're doing. See, you might not know all the theology of God's word. You might not know all the truth of God's word, but every person can do what I'm about to show you right now. Every one of us can do this. The Bible says go get them and compel them. Can you come help me, brother? He said go get them and compel them to come in so that the house of God will be full. Will you bend over my shoulder? And he says go get them and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Would you stay right there? Just stay right there. Just stay right there. And see, you might not know all the truth of the Word of God, but every one of us, can you come help me? The Bible says go get them and compel. Will you bend over my shoulder? He's a, and get them and bring them to the house of God. He's, he's a little bigger than I thought he was. Okay. Okay. Stay right there. And we don't have to just go for the small ones. We can go for the big ones too. Because the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Come on. You just walk. <laughs> I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. Hallelujah. And see, the Bible says, go get them and compel them to come in so that the house of God will be full. I was in Askewville, North Carolina, out of the Outer Banks years ago, and I was teaching on, we've got to bring people to the house of God. And the, a woman came to me after the service, like little sister blonde hair back there. She came up to me after the service, and she said, I'm so glad you said drag them to the house of God. She said, I went to church one morning, and the pastor said, God can heal anybody. God can help anybody. And my son was a crack addict. And crack cocaine was destroying our family and destroying our household. And she said, I went home that afternoon, and he was passed out in front of our television from a crack high. And she said, God, I believe what my pastor said. You can heal anybody. You can touch anybody. She said she tied his hands up. She tied his feet up, and she drug him out to the back seat of her car. She drove to the church. When she got to the church, she came to the side door and she drug him into the sanctuary and laid him right in front of the pulpit where the pastor was preaching. And he said, what are you doing? She said, you said this morning, God can heal anybody. God can help anybody. And she said, I'm tired of the drugs. I'm tired of what it's doing to my boy. And the pastor, just like Pastor Rob, was a loving, compassionate pastor. He called the worship team. If somebody can come to the piano now. He called the worship team. And they came and they began to play the song of the Lord. And they began to sing over that boy and pray over him. After 30 minutes of worship, the power of God came in that room, sobered him up. He got saved. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that boy is an Assemblies of God preacher in North Carolina today while we're sitting in this room. Hallelujah. Now listen to me. 
I am not advocating we go gag and tie people and drag them in here. But I am saying, God, here, here, here's, here's my brother. And he's taller than me, my brother from another mother. And I love him. And I brought him to church, God. Anoint the pastor. Don't let him go to hell. I brought him today. God, get him to the kingdom of God. We can say, God, here's, here's my neighbor. And I love my neighbor, God. Touch his heart. Change his life. Grab him by the hair. Don't let him go to hell. Touch his heart. Change his life. You say, God, here's my daddy. And I love you, daddy. I love you, Daddy. God, please don't let my daddy go to hell. I brought him to church. I got him here. Let Pastor Rob preach today and let him be saved. And one daddy at a time, one friend at a time, one neighbor at a time. If we'll drag them in here, God's going to touch them. God's going to save them. And God's going to change them. A lot of us are waiting on God. God is waiting on us. To obey him and say, I won't for, I, I'm not going to let Fort Lauderdale go to hell while I'm living here. I'm not going to let sunrise go to hell while I'm living here. I'm going to do everything in my power to go get them. For the rest of your life, God is calling you today. He's calling you today. Don't pull my hair. It comes out. Listen, he's calling you today to go and get them and bring them into the house of God. We'll pray for healing next. All right, listen. Would you give my friends a great big hand? Come on. Great job. Great job. Hallelujah. I want you to know what stopped them from feasting at the table of the Lord was an excuse. What excuse is the enemy defeating you with today? Is it because of what a teacher did? Or your daddy did? Or your mama did? Or your neighbors did? government did or a policeman did or something else God says I want to break those excuses off of you that I'm still inviting you to feast at the table with me and I want you to know you're going to have to throw those excuses off because they're killing some of you sitting in this room some of you sitting here this may be the last chance you ever get to hear this the Bible promises a lot it just doesn't promise tomorrow and in this parable it was a story of what it would look like at the end they all wanted to stay home with their spouse. They wanted to stay home with their cattle and their possessions. They wanted to stay home with their property. And God is saying, come to me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Would you bow your heads with me all over this room? No matter who you are in this room, can I tell you this? God loves you. Pastor Rob and Pastor Sidney love you. And I don't know you, but I love you. And I prayed that you would be here today because I'm here to, stand, to serve Pastor Rob. If you're here to the sound of my voice, God is knocking on your heart's door right now. He's saying, let me in, and I will show you life. Come and feast with me. Come and dine at my table, and I will show you life. I don't care how many drugs you've taken, how many drinks you've had, how many things you've done wrong. God says, come to me. Come to me. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you this question. If you die today, do you know that you know that you know that you'd be in heaven with Jesus? It's an important question. Everybody's going to have to answer this question, whether they think they will or not. If you die today, do you know that you'd be in heaven with Jesus? See, you can fool me today because I'm pretty easy to fool. I'm from Alabama. You might be able to fool your friends. You might be able to fool your neighbors. You might be able to fool the police. You might even be able to fool your pastors. But I can tell you this, you'll never fool God. He knows you. He made you. And he says, come to me. Life is a window of time to find God. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, they're screaming in hell right now, begging us to listen. It's too late for those in hell. It is not too late for you and me in this room. I don't care what's gone wrong in your past. If you die today, do you know that you know that you know that you'd be in heaven with Jesus? What if today was your last day and you were killed in an automobile accident out here on I-95? It happens every day. What if it was a hurricane that came here and you were tragically killed? Do you know that you know that you'd be in heaven with Jesus? What if it was a drive-by shooting that's happening more and more and more in South Florida? If you die today, do you know that you know that you could be, feast at that table with Christ? Pray, Christians. I need Christians to pray. Somebody's life is in the balance here. You may never hear this again, but God brought you here today.
to tell you he loves you. He's not mad at you. He doesn't hate you. He loves you. But he loves you too much to leave you where you are. And he's saying, come and eat. Come and feast. Come and sit at the table of the Lord. You're invited. You're good enough. You're smart enough. You're talented enough. You're beautiful enough. You're handsome enough. You know enough. Come and eat. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you're watching online and the excuses are destroying you. Well, I'll just do it every once in a while. I'll just keep it under control. I'll just do it every once in a while. And that once in a while can destroy you forever. God is saying, come to me. Come to me. And I'll show you what real living is all about. I'm not asking you to join this church, although this is an amazing church. I'm asking you to join the kingdom of God. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around, I want to ask you, young lady, young man, mom or dad, guest here today, if you died today, if today was your last day to live on this planet, do you know that you know that you'd be in heaven with Jesus? You're the only person I'm talking to right now. You're the only person I'm talking to. And God is calling you to the table. He's calling you to life. If you're here, no matter if you're on the back row or the front, if you're watching online, you're on the side, you're sitting next to someone. This is not between you and someone next to you. This is between you and the eternal Father who's saying, I have something better for you. So if that's you anywhere in this room, you say, Pastor Johnny, man, I can fool my friends. I can fool my parents. I can fool my pastors. I can even fool the police. But I know I can't fool God. And I need to get closer to him today. I beg of you, if that's you anywhere in this room, you say, I know that's me. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to play the game. I want to make sure that heaven's my home. I need to get closer to Jesus today. No matter who's on your right, left, no matter who's in front of you, behind you, if you're watching online, if that's you anywhere in this room, you say, I know I need to get closer to God. Please, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to play the game. I need him closer in my heart. Would you pray for me? If that's you anywhere in this room, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. Shove it down the devil's throat. Say, I don't want to play the game. I know I can fool everybody else, but I can't fool God. I know I need to get closer to God. If that's you anywhere in this room, when I count to three, raise your hand right now. Shove it down the devil's throat. Here we go. One, two, three. That's me. Yes, yes, I see you, ma'am. I see you, ma'am. I see you, son. I see you, son. I see you, sir. I see you, ma'am. I see you, young lady. I see you, young lady. I see you, sir. I see you, ma'am. I see you, sir. I see you, young man. I see you, young lady. I see you, young lady. I see you, young lady. Hallelujah. You can put your hands down. Can I tell you, there's a party in heaven that just kicked off that the Bible says, the angels in heaven rejoice over someone who comes close to Christ. I'm going to ask one more time. Maybe there's somebody else in this room that you know you should have raised your hand, but you were worried about what somebody might think about you. This is not about you and somebody else. You, it, it, it's, people say, I don't want to be embarrassed. Hell's going to be harder than this altar call. Hell's going to be worse than this altar call if you didn't raise your hand a moment ago. But you say, I know I should have, and I need to get closer to God today. I can fool everybody else, but I can't fool God. I'm tired of the excuses. I want to eat at the table with God. If you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, I beg of you when I count to three, raise it right now. Shove it down the devil's throat. Here we go. One, two, three. If you didn't raise it a minute ago, raise it now. I see you, young man. Oh, I'm so glad I ask again. I see you, young lady. I see you, young man. I see you, young lady. I see you, young lady. I see you, young man. I'm so glad I ask again. Anybody else? I see you, young man. Hallelujah. You can put your hands down. Now, Father, I did everything you told me to do today. I'm asking now that the eternal God of the universe would sweep in this room and wrap your arms of love around every person that just raised their hand and those that didn't but should have. And that you draw them to you and that they will get free today. Come on, God, just setting somebody free. Come on, pray right now. Pray. God's just setting somebody free in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Today's the day. Everybody stand with me. Come on. Everybody stand with me. Those of you that raise your hand, those of you that raise your hand, take the second step with me. Take the second bold step. Jesus was crucified publicly, buried publicly, and resurrected publicly. You're going to have to stand for him publicly. I need everybody in this room, look at somebody next to you and say, do you need to go get closer to Jesus today? Ask them. Ask them. That question can change their life right now. And every person that raised their hand, can we turn the lights back up? Can we turn those lights back up? Every person that raised their hand, every person that raised their hand, I'm going to ask you to take the second bold step. And when I count to three, come stand right up here with me. Shove it down the devil's throat. And say, I'm not playing the game. I'm not making excuses anymore. I want everything God has for me. Every person that raised their hand, or if you didn't, you should have. When I count to three, you come right now. Here we go. One, two, three. Come on. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. 
Get out of your seat. Get out of your seat. Get out of your seat. Come on, all the way. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Come on. I'm waiting. Come on. I'm waiting. Come on. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Come on. I'm waiting. Come on. Come on. Every person that raise their hand. Every person raise their hand. Hallelujah. Come on. If you have a friend or a family member up here, come stand with them. If you have a friend or a family member up here, come and stand with them. Let me get everybody else in the building. Come and stand behind them now. Everybody else in the building, step out of your seat and come and stand behind these right now that God is going to do a new work. God is going to do a new work. God is going to do a new work. Pastor Sydney, come here. Pastor Sydney, would you stand with this sweet girl right here? Hallelujah. Everybody in the building, can you step out of your seat and come in? Move in real close. Move in real close. Move in real close. Look at me. Let me tell you something. When I came in today, I looked over at you sitting on that aisle. And the Lord said, tell him that it's my son. And I have a work for him to do. And the enemy's distracted you. But God is saying, come home, son. Come and eat at the table of the Lord. And today, everything you look for, God says, I will fulfill and all the hurt that's in your heart, sweetheart. All the hurt. God says, I'll wash it. I'll wash it all away, son. He'll take it all. When I looked at you when I came in the room today, the Lord said to tell her she ran with me one time but the enemy distracted her. But today I'm calling her home. And see, you're worth more than what a man thinks. You're worth more than what your friends think. You're worth what God thinks. Today he's putting his hand on you and saying, I have life for you. Life. And he wants you to live, sweetheart. He wants you to live. Look at me. All those that are standing in this altar, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, I want you to know I'm the worst sinner of all. I feel like the Apostle Paul. I'm a chief of sinners. And I want you to look at me and I want you to know something, sweetheart. It's a new beginning. God says I can wash it all away and I can make it like you're brand new and you're a new creation. For this young man, I want you to know, when I looked over there and I picked you up, I didn't just pick you out of the crowd because I needed a, a, a slender young man. I picked you up because God said, I'm putting my hand on him today. I'm putting my hand on him. And just like you feel my hand on you, God is putting his hand on you. And no matter where you've been, it's a new beginning. It's a new beginning, bro. It's a new beginning. That you keep coming here till you get it right. You're going to get it right. You're going to finish the song. Listen to me. There's a song in you. There's a song in you that the Lord is waiting to sing through you. And get ready, man. I'm going, you're going to remember my ugly face. And you're going to remember this day that God is going to sing through you. Look at me, sweetheart. Stop letting the, uh, what people think about you stop you. And think of the great thing God thinks about you and what he can make you. That today is your day to say, God, I give you everything. I want to lead you to prayer. And if you're at home watching online, you pray this prayer. And I need everybody in the building to pray this prayer out loud so nobody be embarrassed. Everybody pray this. And the Lord said, put you on the platform because he says, I'm changing things for you today. I need everybody to pray this out loud so nobody be embarrassed. Look at me. You're going to hold your head up. You don't have to look down. This is a new day for you. And you, you look at me. You're not going to hurt by yourself anymore. God is going to hurt with you. And God is going to help you, son. Let me tell you something. You held your hand up right there. I saw the power of God come on you. I saw the power of God come on you. What you feel is the power of God. Take my hand. God is saying today, hold his hand. And he will never let you go. And you will win, son. You will win. Stretch your hands toward these. Everybody pray this out loud. You pray this with me. Everybody pray this out loud so nobody be embarrassed. Everybody pray this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I know it was my sin that nailed you on that cross. And I'm sorry, Jesus. Please forgive me. I know I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. So I say with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ. And I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. 
I give you my past, all of my mistakes, all of my hurt, all of my pain, all of my sin. I start over today. I give you my future, everything I will ever become. And I receive you now as my Lord, as my Savior, as my soon coming King. You died for me. Help me live for you for the rest of my days. I throw off the excuses. I won't justify it anymore. I want to be free of my past. I want to be a new creation. And I receive it now in Jesus' name. My new beginning in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody clap for these that prayed that prayer. Come on. Somebody touch them on the shoulder. Somebody touch these in the front on the shoulder. Every person who came forward, touch, reach over. Touch them on the shoulder. Father, today, never the same. They are the property of Jesus Christ. They are not what they were when they walked in this building. They're a new creation. The old is washed away. The new has come. And it's a new day. 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 For them today, they're not going to be what they were. It's a new day, God. It's a new day, God. A new beginning. A new beginning. How old are you? Come up here with me. Come up here. Oh, Stretch your hands toward this girl. Stretch your hands toward her. Come on, church, right now. I'm just telling you, when I looked at you, the Lord said that you're going to dance for Him. You're going to dance for Him. You're going to dance for Him. You get alone in your bedroom, sweetheart, if you can't do it in here, and you cut a rug for Jesus. You dance for Him. Every time you dance, there's going to be an earthquake in hell. And things are going to be broken. Dance only for Him. Dance for Him and watch what God. You're going to remember this day. that Just like my hand is on you. Just like I said to Him. God, God's hand is coming on you. Stretch your hands toward her. Father, do your work. Do your full work. Do everything you want to do in her. And all of these that are in this altar. That they will never be the same. You'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. It's a new work for what God has for you. Lift your hands all over this room and give Him praise. Father, we lift our hands to you. We lift our hearts to you. And we believe today, oh God, that you are speaking into our hearts in Jesus' name. Will you give these a standing ovation one more time? Come on. Listen to me. Let me tell you something. Three things. Number one, stay right here. Three things. Number one, get baptized in water. Even if you've done it before. Obviously, it didn't work the first time. It, did, it didn't work for me the first time. Because I didn't understand dying in water to rise up in resurrection life. I'm just telling you, you have no idea what God is unleashing in your life. As Russia, the Lord says, say this to you. As Russia is unleashing bombs on those poor people in Ukraine. The Lord is unleashing Holy Spirit bombs in your life. And He's going to blow up those things that have tried to hurt you. And the Lord is unleashing. He's turning the switch on today. And He's breaking it in the on position. And you're going to remember this. And the Lord is saying, stay with these pastors. And God is going to help you. Even if you've been baptized before get baptized in water to die in that watery grave and come up in resurrection life that I identify with Jesus let me tell you why I pick on you it's not just because you're sitting in the back next to that ugly guy back there ugly guy can you come up here yeah he knows who he is yeah I'm just kidding he's not ugly hallelujah are y'all are together are y'all married yeah will you join hands with her there's something supernatural God has for your household. That the Lord had me pick you out. And God has something so wonderful for you. That if you will stay with this pastor, God is going to unleash his power through you. And you will influence many. You're an influencer. You know it. You influence other people. It's time for you to influence them for the kingdom. That they know who Jesus is because of you. And because of you, men of God. And I want to encourage you to get baptized in water. 
Second thing is if you have something in your house that is not pleasing to God, if it's drugs or alcohol or, or, or anything in your house, trash it, burn it, flush it, get rid of it. Demons are attached to it, and it will hurt you again. It will hurt you again. Get it out of your life and let this church hold you in accountability so that you can walk this out right. Third thing is if you're in a relationship that is not a God relationship, the pastors of the church will help you, and they'll help you navigate this so that you know what to do. Can you come up here with me one more time? You're going to forget a lot of things that were said today. I hope you don't forget this. Will you come up here? How many of you know somebody who's not a Christian? Hold your hand up. It's time that we go get them. Time is short. This parable is about the end of time. That property and cattle and relationships were more important. How many of you know somebody who's not a Christian? It's time for us to go get them and bring them into the house of God and say God has something big that He wants to do with you. And if we will go and get them and we will bring them, God will do His work. Just like that man back there with the white hair, God will use you. Just like that man right there, hold your hand up right there. Yeah, you with the blue on mm -hmm, you. Hold it up high. You don't think God can do this through you. But get ready, man of God. If you'll stay with this man, God is going to use you in a mighty way. In a mighty way. That other things have been distractions. This is the time God is saying, I have a new thing. And if you ever taste it, like a drug addict has to have a drug or an alcoholic has to have a drink, you have to have God. And God's going to, you're going to remember this day. Amen. What's your name? Lawrence. I love you, Lawrence. I'm so honored you're here. Stretch your hands toward Lawrence. Would you just call his name? I bless you, my friend. Father, touch Lawrence today. Let him know you care about him. That no matter what has been in his past, what has been around him, today is a new day for Lawrence. And let him know your great love and your hope and your joy and your power of what you want to do in him in Jesus' name. Come on, say it. No more excuses. Come on, let the devil hear you. No more excuses. And if we can believe today, let's fill this house and go get them next week and get them in here. And pastor will tell them, give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on. Thank you, Johnny. That is a challenge. Next week, bring somebody with you. Amen. Listen, when you leave today, a couple things. If you're a first-time guest, uh, make sure you stop by the guest table out there and get your gift. And also at that table is the sign-up sheet for water baptism on March the 27th. And we want to invite you to be here for that. Listen, Life Point Church. Thank you for being here today. We love you, and we will see you real soon. Can, real soon. Can we worship God on our way out of here today? Is that okay? Not forsaken, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am.